My name is Maria, and you are listening to the podcast where we deconstruct someone's PhD experience so that you can reconstruct your own. This is a journey with many challenges, but you might find yourself in a similar situation as one of the guests here. Enjoy listening. I would like to introduce this person to you before you start listening to the episode, but Julia is such a colorful person that this task is very difficult. When did I meet Julia? The time when he came to do the podcast. He got up at 3 a.m. that day, flew from Barcelona to Eindhoven, worked the whole day and appeared at my door at 8 p.m. full of enthusiasm to make this episode. I'm very grateful for that. As a short intro, Julia is a research engineer who is passionate about technology. He's also an entrepreneur interested in bringing value to the market and a very passionate kite surfer. Unfortunately, the last story did not make it to the final edit of the podcast. But if you like to know more, you can ask him yourself. As a side note, the initial audio settings were not optimal, so the voice sometimes go robotic. I'm still looking for the best way how to do this. Enjoy listening. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. When your name came up, the connection was Onions and PhD. That's why I was super excited to have this conversation and to see how the two go together. (laughs) They come together very organically. Maybe the Onion story comes after the PhD story, so let's go in a hierarchical order. Yeah, let's go in hierarchical order. You had a PhD, which was a bit unusual. Well, it was between the university and the company, is that correct? Exactly, exactly. So actually, actually it was even unusual how, how I got to have the PhD because I was not really looking for it. Actually, I was in a room saying, I don't want to do a PhD. Oh. <laughs> so that's how it started, the idea. Of the was like, this was like during bachelor and master, you were absolutely not for this idea. So actually, I have a kind of unusual track. I did a bachelor and uh, very straight away and went to the industry, worked for a time. And then I got to do a master's thanks of a scholarship that mm-hmm. paid me the master's and the full tuition. And then I got more like, okay, maybe PhD is something interesting. However, after doing the, my master's, I was like, that was a hell of a work to do the master thesis. I will never do a PhD. I wanted to be in the industry. So it all started one day that uh, after finishing my master's, I went to see a professor to say hi. And then we were having a conversation and he, he just challenged me like, oh, Julia, how is your work? I said, well, it's nice, but maybe I would like to do something more research. I, I'm missing a research factor. Maybe I should look for another company. And he opened the door like, okay, I think maybe, Julia, what you're describing is you want to do a PhD. <laughs> and you're like, no, 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 leave me out of this. And I said, absolutely, I will never do a PhD. I said, okay, okay. He answered, that was my professor, Eduard Alarcón, Universitat Politécnica de Barcelona. But yeah, then we were talking and said, okay, you are a guy that makes very good questions, so I think that you would be a good researcher. So said, okay, Eduard, I would do only a PhD under these two following conditions, if it's abroad and if it's in a company. And this man that is always busy said, okay, let me write it down here. So I thought that would never really translate to anything. I was talking with one of my best friends in Barcelona before I'd been living abroad. My friend said, when are you going to stay in Barcelona? Because you're always abroad. Mm. And so I said, yeah, I'm done of tra- traveling. I have a job and I will look for an apartment. I'm staying to Catalonia. So the next day I go to the university to fix some paperwork. I meet this professor and say, hey, Julia, you know what you told me? I find a PhD to do it for Philips in the Netherlands in the topic that you want, power electronics and microelectronics. Are you interested? So, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I just decided to yeah, yeah, I, just deci- I, ju- I just decided. I just decided. Also, then I came for a visit and when I saw the high-tech campus and I saw all the facilities and I saw how it would look my place where in the company I was before I had to fight for an oscilloscope. And <laughs> when I went to Philips and they, they showed me the instrumentarium and I could really choose one, 200 different oscilloscopes maybe and the best instruments. Uh, I was quite impressed and excited, you know, like coming to, to this corporation and, and also very insecure, you know, like working with these researchers. The first interview, it was like 10 people in a room asking me about my research. But was it like an R&D department in Philips or? I was working for Philips Research in the department that they were working in power electronics. So you did your research in Philips? So, yeah. So then I came with something that's actually a really nice uh, position. I got a Vanderpol position. 
So Philips opened a PhD in the field of integrated drivers because at that time Philips was trying to penetrate the LED market. So we were transforming from regular light bulb towards LED light bulbs. And the main strategy of Philips was like, okay, cost reduction. So we will try to make it through making the cheapest possible light bulb. And all the department of Philips were working towards that direction. So this was before Signify? Way before Signify. We are talking 2009, 2000. I, I started 2011, but the conversations it started, I think, in 2010. The person who brought me here was Edouard Alarcon. It's a professor in the field of power electronics and microelectronics, uh, which I established a good uh, relationship through my master's. And he had to, uh, one of his students, former students, was Tony Lopez. He was a brilliant student and he did a PhD in the field of optimization of transistors. And then he got a position in Philips and he worked for Philips. He did a lot of modeling of um, semiconductors to optimize the structures. And then he moved towards uh, modeling of LED structures. So that was my contact and that was the person who was my company supervisor. Respo- yeah, yeah. company supervisor, so a mm. guy from so, yeah. Barcelona like me. So then Tony Lopez and another colleague from Philips was like, okay, we're not doing fundamental research. Price reduction is one way to bring in them to the market. Is it the way? <laughs> His feeling was, okay, LEDs, it's breakthrough. And one of the breakthroughs is that we can really miniaturize the light source. So it's very, very small. If we go just all the way of like trying to make cheap LED drivers, maybe we are forgetting that we can make them small and that's maybe the sense of the led you know so we have this uh, very little energy i like light source but this very big led driver with reduced functionality and actually it's a massive market so we have to do a lot of these circuits they thought i think that it would worth to research if we could do integrated led drivers so we just put more power electronics inside the chip that was a hot topic at the time that's why philips opened this vanderpoel position where i was the researcher to work on it. So I arrived to Eindhoven with a contract with the condition that I had to do a PhD. Where I would do it, they, they, I, they, they, we had to find what it was more suitable. I could do it linked to the University of Barcelona. I thought that it was more interesting to do it linked to the University mm. of Eindhoven. Oh, so uh, then for, you went so, uh, with your contract waving at TUE and... Uh, yeah, kind of, yeah, kind of, kind of, kind of. I went to the TUE and you know, they were like, okay, who is this guy from Barcelona? Like, <laughs> yeah, so it was more like, okay i have the money and i have this so i have <laughs> you to want fight. to accept me usually yeah. the other way around yeah happens. exactly exactly <laughs> so, and they accepted me so it was all very unusual at the end, I, I just arrived here without not really knowing what I was going to do. <laughs> just uh, seeing, okay, that's a fancy opportunity, and I took it. And how was this experience? <laughs> because you say this was just a start. I'm curious to hear the Okay, yeah, yeah. Part of the group was dedicated to uh, electromagnetism, mainly motors. Actually, the founders of ProDive came from this group. So then to drive these motors, you need power electronics. Yeah. The difference was more that my power range was like four orders of magnitude lower, you know, what they were used to. My PhD was more in the realm of microelectronics. The group was not really so, so used to, so that I had to collaborate with other groups at the TV. So after one year and a half or two years, I did some breakthroughs and I showed some potential, potential direction where to go. So I created a new family of circuits. Then that was enough to win STW and that brought us to more researchers. Maybe you didn't really achieve to, <laughs> to do things together very far to, besides some publications, but uh, they were the first people to listen to you, you know? That's why for me it was nice. I had two more uh, <laughs> warriors. <laughs> That's how I started really collaborating with all the groups. All of this engagement of stakeholders, it sounds very complex. You know, you have people in one group at TV, you have people in another group at TV, you have Philips, you have your professor in Barcelona. How was it to, uh, let's say, get everybody on the same page in this uh, mess? <laughs> I think that I didn't really got everybody to the same page. I, I was more an initiator, which it brought to more people, but we didn't really create a project towards one goal, but it was my idea. And that maybe was a beginning of frustrations, you know, like why I'm not really making people converge. And at the same time, you have to be delivering your own PhD, you know, like publications, then it comes another degree that I could not really make any publication. I have to patent. So as I 
created my new family of circuits. I was asked to, before doing any publication, we check with the internal committee of Philips if um, that could be disclosed. Lucky of me that invention disclosure got a lot of attention because it was an empty field of patents. So it went through very nice patent attorney. They check it, the committee evaluated, and then they realized that any of the circuits I would do, they would need to be published. Actually, I was a bit pushed to publish any any single idea that it could be a pattern so that it turned that I just have nine publications as a first author. So my PhD basically was writing ideas, making patterns and try to do all the work that you can demonstrate, but with um, simple circuits. So I could not really integrate them because I didn't have the financial resources. Mm. After one year and a half, Philips changed direction. And then I got another group leader that they got me as a <laughs> heritage. And then you are just one member of Philips. You are in the cost of structure of Philips, doing a research for Philips, but um, there's no continuity. I would continue doing my stuff, but then it's like, okay, I just have all these ideas that they have to do integrated in microelectronics, who is going to build cheap for me. Getting the resources, you don't really have the control. So I would maybe get the internal resources, but I would point it, okay, I would like this person to start building an integrated circuit for me. But internally, they would say it differently and they would say, yeah, we think that maybe you should go towards that way. Maybe some money is saved since we don't really need to do a semiconductor. It's more that you, you just feel that you are not getting the progress and you are not really in the position to change. So at the same time, you really, okay, let's get your PhD done. So there's one moment that all this frustration of really doing research, doing patterns, producing quality research, believing that you do something interesting, thinking that you <laughs> dreaming like, okay, these things are really, really nice. I mean, why we don't implement it? Why, maybe it's a breakthrough. Why I cannot prove it all the way through, you know? At the same time, it's like, okay, I need a PhD. And you are also growing internally. I don't really like to do that or my ideas are not sold. Before leaving to Philips, and this is something that was in my head, when I tell to my roommate in Barcelona, I'm going to do a PhD in the Netherlands and so on and my friend told me it doesn't really feel that you are very your heart doesn't really want to go there I think you just took a decision in your mind and did you feel like this afterwards? I always felt like this I felt like okay I think that this opportunity it was like a car drive in front of me a nice Ferrari <laughs> <laughs> with a beautiful lady inside and then she opens the door and says, do you want to jump in? I say, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Did I know where this direction goes? Maybe this Ferrari drive, I just jump in because I'm attracted to the offer. Yeah. But I don't really know. I'm not asking, hey, where are you driving you? And I like uh, this. okay, I'm doing a PhD because of very rational decision. But do I know what I want in my heart? Probably not. So throughout this journey, with all this configuration, stakeholders, how you keep motivated, how you, you keep performing, how you keep in a group when you, it, it, it's very difficult, you know, because yeah, I was not being evaluated like a Philips employee, although I did nine patents in less than two years. I don't really think that many people in Philips can claim nine patents granted in three no. years and no one came and said, whoa, you did a good job. It was really a lot of irritation. It's like, okay, I really felt that I was not really achieving. Anyone, I had to always defend my ideas. I had to <laughs> defend my ideas. I could get little posters and I could not really show my circuits. Mm. And at the same time, it was really too much work. I'm just happy that I'm doing ideas and I'm demonstrating them, but no one feels that it's appreciating them. What I have to do, at the same time, you really see that you really move forward. You have your contributions, no one can deny them. And then maybe you have beautiful moments in the PhD and in terms of like you meet the people that give you this recognition. In the research world, we are focusing a lot on finding these problems and discussing only about problems. So when you go to a meeting, usually it's like, what's wrong here? What is missing here? It's never saying this was really good. This worked <laughs> like bravo guys. Yeah. After a while, if you're always staying in this mentality doesn't bring you any kind of balance that you maybe start transferring this also in I, other I, areas of your life <laughs> as well. Yeah. You are over critical. I, yeah. I, I'm seen as a very over critical person against myself and against others. 
we are scientists and we solve problems that they are solvable. So, so at the end we achieve the results that we want, but maybe the, the journey is not being so pleasant. But since we know how to fight to get to the result, it's pleasant because at the end you graduate, the PhD, very yeah. happy and done. I like a short story where you compare people who are goal-oriented or process-oriented. So there is a, a family going in a car to Disneyland and there are two kids. One kid is a like goal-oriented, one kid is process-oriented. The one who is goal-oriented, he's like, we are going to Disneyland and this is what I'm expecting of today. Nothing else is important. And the car breaks halfway to Disneyland. In the end, they don't go to Disneyland. And what happens? They go back home. The kid who was goal-oriented, he didn't get to Disneyland. And for him, it was a totally missed day. It was a fail. Nothing happened. And the other kid who is process-oriented, they're driving and he's looking outside of the window. There is like a different scenery. There are birds. There's rain. There's sun. Yeah, there's yeah. whatever. Like there's so many things happening at yeah. the same time because it's a journey. Even though he doesn't get to the goal, Goal that was yeah. intended. Lots of things happened, so he can also integrate this experience. <laughs> So also the PhD, it's a difficult one because it's a goal in itself, getting the degree in the end. We all came there to, you know, wave this diploma, which in the end you can do <laughs> nothing with it. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think not so many of us are focusing on the process. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of process of figuring it out and irritation. So with my line manager, Wolfen Buder, it was my new line manager. He told me to shape my direction towards the future because we had very difficult conversations. Um, what does that mean? I would irritate him absolutely because he would say, what is this cost that I have sitting there in the corner? He doesn't talk to anyone. He's doing a PhD that maybe Philips Semiconductors, it's not really interesting. It's, it's a cost, you know, and he's in a moment that Philips is like in a completely earthquake. So then we'd have meetings and it would feel that I would not deliver or the things that I deliver maybe are not from interest and from there we really got to a very tense situation out of this tense situation where I find my direction more entrepreneurship he would just challenge me to communicate better my ideas and through this process I started going to his office pitching one idea and convincing something about him and then after two weeks pitching about another idea and he was like okay I like you you pitch well then I started going to Toastmasters and improving to pitch more my ideas you know I'm going a bit all over the place <laughs> But uh, yeah. maybe that goes in line uh, with what happened after the PhD for you. You chose entrepreneurship. It's very related. The situation is why, in one hand, I was in Philips. I felt that I was doing progress. I was creating undeniable contributions, you know. So, for example, I reformulated one of the theories in power electronics for switch capacitor converters, that there was a problem that it was not solved, wow. from Dragan Maximovich, one of the fathers of power electronics. And I had to be defending this theory because my group, they didn't know this theory. They know more power electronics from another perspective that is inductive. But once I went to also this journey in the PhD, I had uh, moments of, of like, wow, that's unique and no, no one will take it. I was in Boulder, Colorado, and Dragon Maximovich has an office. So I thought, okay, this person wouldn't be bothered if I knocked to his door without an appointment. And I was very shy because I felt very insecure about my research because no one was feeling traction about what I was doing. And I was in Boulder, Colorado, visiting a friend, and I was walking in the mountains with my jeans, I with my mountain and uh, dirty backpack. And at some point I said, I'm going to talk to this guy. I'm going to talk to him. So I went out down of the mountains. I walked to his office like full of dirt. dirt. <laughs> <laughs> I knocked to this door. Then I explained my theory and said, oh yeah, come. He was a friend of Edward. I explained my theory. I said, oh, that's really beautiful theory. So besides these darkness moments, you also have these moments of recognition. I made it one step forward. It's like you who made this huge step to knock his door. You know, it's not an easy step to say, oh, I'm going to approach the guy who invented this uh, theory that uh, the whole world knows. Uh, let me see what he thinks about it. You need to be super self-confident to do that. <laughs> well, I, I was talking with Edward and Edward was always very confident with my capabilities, you know. Okay. 
all this journey, I really look at it with a lot of joy because it was hard, but at the end, life is hard. Nothing is perfect, you know, so we have to <laughs> understand. <laughs> so it was four years and a half of my life that Philips paid me. I didn't have to give too much explanation of what I was doing. This, I loved it. <laughs> Maybe my ideas were not really of interest of Philips. And that was frustrating because I put a lot of efforts. I did a lot of patent contribution and I de- I never really got joy out of it. And that's maybe why when the onions kick in. <laughs> <laughs> they bring the joy. <laughs> they bring the joy. <laughs> and it also made me realize that uh, because maybe I had this very romantic idea in my head that it's you crack very hard ideas. If you solve very hard problems, you are bringing a lot of value to humanity. I'm, I guess that many of us, we are very nerds and we can think a lot. Maybe my inspiration was like I always could crack difficult problems or more or less difficult I integrated circuit that would bring a lot of value to humanity the reality is that you are sitting in an office in Philips <laughs> doing these contributions and you don't really know how to bring it to the wall and to the people that you're showing maybe they, they are not appreciating hmm. so at some point you are just like trying to f- finding the joy throughout the other doors yes. it's also probably one of the misconceptions in academia that you just have to do great research and people will appreciate it the world is going to advance uh, whatever it's really uh, like a illusion in academia whereas it's all about connections talking to people how you pitch your idea coming back one million times like you did to your supervisor you know improving your pitch failing one million times growing your credibility that's a little yeah. bit what i realized that at the end your contributions it's you against the science and you have to own them if you don't believe it uh, we don't move forward i believe it and i want to present it and i'm gonna present it mm. so that's one of the things that i learned in the phd and the other thing that I learned it was that it's not about doing a hard idea it's more doing a valuable idea and that's where I found that maybe the way of doing valuable ideas it's through entrepreneurship because if people pay you for something like a, a, at the end a business it's like okay I'm solving a problem or I satisfying a necessity that's the essence of yeah. a business people can say oh I like it and so on but if they pay you that, you know that's, for sure that there's that, 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 that's some value and then it's where I started falling really in love in the entrepreneurship and then how I shifted it was what I said in, in Philips I was having very difficulty to, to sell my ideas I think I was at the wrong group in the wrong time I many times believed I would have been with another group that it was not really being shifted direction I would be in Philips working there and maybe that's what it happened I find my join outside how did this happen what was the incentive I mean I love cooking I always cooked for people you know like in Catalonia we have the most innovative onion <laughs> from the wall <laughs> the only onion that makes you smile instead of making you cry <laughs> This onion, it's called calzotada. So throughout struggling this journey that I went up and down through it, I just was asked by some friends, hey, Julia, you do calzotada, why you don't do it in Eindhoven? I said, well, yeah, I love it. You know, I've always been the guy that I like to organize to eat together or, or to, to cook for people come from my family. So I said, okay, let's do it. But it's quite messy and I didn't know where to do it. So I asked uh, Kettle's house, Eindhoven. Yeah, I'm from Barcelona. We are five people. We want to, to do this Calzotada event. So we would like to rent a grill for five people. How it would be the arrangement? <laughs> so they came back to me and they said, hey, come to talk to us. So I went, I show all the things. And I said, oh, that's, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> I said, okay, okay, so much interest. <laughs> and then they said, hey, why we don't do a Facebook event? And for me, like, and we will do a very easy arrangement. So you told me that you are 20 people? I was, no, 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 five, five. Oh, you can be 20 or 30, or if you are 50, even if you are 100, it's no problem. The more, the merrier. Okay, I, I'm an enthusiastic guy, you know. Okay, okay, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> so then we will do it like this. So if you are 50 people, you buy onions for 100 people, we will pay you the half. You cook the onions for everyone, we cook meat, give it for free to your friends, and they pay the drinks. 
I'm like, what Sounds the good. fuck? <laughs> I was bored and very frustrated at work, not really feeling anyone buying into my ideas, really putting my heart, my hours and my time. Suddenly, they opened me the doors and they just let me organize. I said, okay, let's do it. So we got uh, 100 people. No marketing, just a bit of Facebook. Me, overexcited, Amazing. telling to all the Catalans in Philips, <laughs> hey, calzotada, calzotada. <laughs> Catalans, they see this like, uh, yeah, they're just gold, like, oh, calzotada. So we got 100 people and that's what I, I think it's how I become the onion guy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, at that time that I did it, I started doing this thing of public talking, pitching, and so on. So I was started getting close to entrepreneurship. So, so the situation it went like this. Well, it was very hard to bring the onions, so I had to bring it using blah blah car. I did a lot of work, and then it's also sometimes you're enthusiastic yourself. I remember going uh, <laughs> with a rental car full of onions to pick them up somewhere in Belgium on a Thursday. The next day, you know, like you smelling onions. <laughs> Onion, all your house smells onion and then on Saturday like preparing everything and you're like in front of like thousand onions and like what the fuck it is a <laughs> lot of work I'm a, I'm a researcher I don't know but I did it and people was extremely grateful people was very grateful they enjoyed it they were happy for me it was a hell of a work and at the end I end up eating the onions alone <laughs> <laughs> but not because, crying but laughing <laughs> yeah yeah it was a lot of work because I was like everyone was finished and I say I will never do it again that was my internal take on that so the same as PhD I will never do a PhD uh, it's always uh, like the, actually I, <laughs> I lived in Lille my Erasmus and I said uh, when I came back to Barcelona I will never live in a flat place far from the sea <laughs> <laughs> Here I am in the Netherlands, you know? <laughs> do you have something that you say now, I will never do that? I think I don't really say it anymore, you know, like... So what did it mean for you to organize this uh, Calzotada event? <laughs> That was a lot of fun and I did it naturally and I made it happen, but it was a lot of work. And at the same time, maybe I felt guilty, you know, because I was having so much fun that I was not used to. Sometimes you just want to show that you are very a big professional, you know, and say, yeah, I'm doing a research in Philips. Oh yeah, nice, nice. And say, yeah, I'm selling onions to drunk people. No, no, <laughs> no, no, to drunk people, no, no, sorry, sorry. To people who maybe get a bit uh, drunk. Actually, the guys in Kettle House, they were super enthusiastic. We would have a lot of fun. So I stayed to one year that I didn't do it. Throughout that year, I was I was getting more attracted about entrepreneurship. And I found my place about pitching. And then I joined uh, Startup Weekend uh, Eindhoven. Just to go to pitch, I thought that I would go on a Friday, practice a pitch, leave. And then I end up pitching two ideas. And then I got a team. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got horrified. Okay, what is these people? And uh, I like to sit behind my computer Why and think about so that. Enthusiastic. <laughs> Guys, you should be sad about it. <laughs> but, but then uh, I started getting in this startup, so my ideas would sell towards all entrepreneurs. But I would be a terrible manager of people because you work at Philips alone. And maybe that's why I was not also succeeding at Philips. You know, I was not being able to do this sell inside. At the end, Philips period got to an end. I got my PhD. Throughout this period, I already found that my next step would be in entrepreneurship. Uh, in a company here in Eindhoven, ICT Group, what they wanted is to bring ideas to business. So what I realized is out of this process that I have a big understanding of technology and then, okay, your PhD is research, but to create a company it's research, you know, so you have to, you can do it in a scientific process. And I started falling in love in this process and I wanted to bring it in this company. One of the things that they appreciated the most in my interviews is that uh, I was organizing my second festival of the onions. <laughs> <laughs> so I skipped one year. First time was 2013. 2014, I skipped it, but so many people asked it that 2016, that I was finishing the PhD, I decided to organize it again. And then at the same time, as I said, the second year that I did the festival, I got 250 people. I worked one more year doing the same, like bringing ideas, thinking what is a unicorn product. And then we did the third year and I got 500 people. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> I said, okay, that's kind of like, it's, it's crazy. So it started getting like a, a fantasy, like, 
so many people and these people brings me more people very hard very out of my topic i will never really build a company but i will be using to try to have one year event so then i register a company like also <laughs> so that was 2017 i did uh, calso 2018 we did about, again 500 people i distributed calso somewhere else then i repeated so calso was happening we were doing traction the economical results were not what we were expecting but it's very difficult to create a business out of completely different field i didn't have too much thoughts but i was creating i am some very happy people in the last calso that i did in 2018 i was like whoa actually people like to eat the calsots but actually this is something people want to share i'm gonna just ship uh, boxes so if, since i have so many calsots then i will do a button in my web and order calsotada box online with raw onions and so on <laughs> so i did a festival <laughs> but and so the delivery guy was very happy delivering <laughs> onions smelling it <laughs> i was the delivery guy myself oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so i put this and i had zero expectation and then one sunday i'm with my friends and i really see like okay well somebody it's transferred 70 euros on my account what is happening oh I made a cell. <laughs> so I made a, I, I made a cell of uh, calzots. I can show you my first client. Oh, so happy. Your house smells onions. Everything. <laughs> you like, okay, I'm a researcher. I'm with onions. Oh, I was super ashamed to go to deliver onions at seven in the morning to a lady in Balkans bar. But I went and I did it. And then when I did it, she opened the door and she was like, oh, thank you very much. You are giving us life with that it's Spanish nos das la vida con esto she could not believe it that it was my first client she was so so blessed and so happy that's beautiful and when I closed I left I was with a smile I went at work my colleagues were like fascinated that I sold a box of onion online that sentence kept in my mind a lot for a long time well how, how it could be this person they, she paid you 70 euros she thank you for your effort and on top of that she's happy you know which when i did the phd not so much joy not so yes. much uh, gratitude yeah the money is irrelevant because i could not complain in that part you know <laughs> yeah but that does not bring you joy that at a certain point also during my phd i was feeling a similar way what you were saying you imagine that you are doing this great work you're providing value people are happy grateful you improve somebody's life but in the field that we do you see this maybe in 10 years if this idea lives because all of us are doing like so much different research something is gonna fly something is not gonna fly and then you're gonna see it in 10 years from now you know somebody and, and this person might not even be aware i was doing things related to telecommunication and now we have like optical fibers in home you send information super fast you know from one part of the world to the other and people take this for granted nobody's saying oh thank you you know all the researchers who <laughs> made this happen that in covid we also could work online without bugs without trouble like uh, lots of people kept their work etc and then i was reading that where you could see instant gratification was a hairdresser because in one hour you instantly make people feel different and feel happy and for us it's like over years you can see an effect on people if you are doing this deep tech stuff that is going to be who knows when implemented but the same with the calzotadas like you deliver this people have a smile on their face they know that they're going to cook it for lunch or for dinner and they're like super happy immediately the process uh, it has been very fun because at mm. the end there's lots of memories that i have a very warm feeling but of what i achieve in terms of traction it's amazing because a major brand manufacturer of beers they came last year with ten, a group of 10 people they shoot me i was uh, wow. instagram of estrella Dam in spain super cool i was in the newspaper as a innovator no one came to ask me hey julia you just did a nine patents of uh, like <laughs> microelectronics that maybe we can integrate the power converter inside the laptop whoa what <laughs> what a happiness to people you know like it's it's also 
simple. We simple. think that it's this is simple, like an act of kindness, you know, like yeah. waking up at seven in the morning and bringing a box of vegetables to a lady. It sounds like no big deal, but in the end, you have to put effort in that as well. You yeah. have to import the onions, you have to wake up early, <laughs> oh, yeah, you oh, have yeah, to yeah. drive there. You have to lose money because <laughs> at the end you're building a business, you know, so. But it, this is really triggered me a lot. So I put two years of my life in, in, in this. Because at the end, one of the things that I realized is like you can be doing technology, you can be solving problems, but maybe as humans, we need to try to be more close to each other, you know, to be more brothers with each other or sisters, you know, like be a bit more kind. Totally, totally <laughs> with you. More, fun, yes. more, more kind. And if we are more kind, we can start really enjoying more the process of doing the things. And that's maybe the inspiration behind like Alsotada because I, I'm bringing audience to people, but at the end I'm just mixing cultures and that's literally the message. Uh, if I manage to build the company that I always dream to build uh, throughout onions and happiness. <laughs> <laughs> and, there is a motto somewhere here. <laughs> it really fascinates me the quantity of love that I get back from doing that. From the journalism, from the neighbor to my parents that uh, she barely talks to me. When I finished the PhD, she told me, ah, your mom told me that the thing that you were doing, uh, this thing that you were doing, you already done it. Congratulations. <laughs> Which, when I was in the local newspaper because I was bringing onions, she crossed the street, she came, I said, I'm proud of you, so proud that you bring this to people. Sometimes science also and research, we cannot explain it so easily, you know. When my parents are about to explain what I'm doing, they're like, yeah, 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 you know, some circuits, uh, light is flowing there. Like, <laughs> Just do your stuff, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for me, I think my family, it's, every time it, for them, it's more complicated and more complicated to think what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> they, and they say, just find the job. <laughs> <laughs> As I mentioned in the beginning, your name, when I heard it, was always, you know, Calzotada. Now, for me, it was also revealing to hear stories about your PhD, because I guess not so many people nowadays know this part. I mean, the last time that I talked about my PhD, it was a person that would help me about my entrepreneurship. And my personal choice is more to go towards Calzotada, but this person say, man, your PhD is also a huge potential of business, you know, like... Maybe as a summary... What would you recommend to somebody who is thinking about doing a PhD or is currently in this uh, journey? To try to enjoy the process as a maximum. Okay, let me go back then. Sorry, one yeah. step. If somebody told you when you were doing your PhD to enjoy, how would you take this? That's what my professor told me, enjoy. And for me, I took it like, I don't know how I will enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So how, how did this happen for you? When somebody told you, oh, just enjoy, uh, have fun or whatever? That would be the first fundamental question. Let's go back. Is it worth it to do a PhD? Personally, I'm very proud of it. It's something that no one would take it out of me. It was a personal mission that I, I enjoyed, but this is my personal motivation. What comes out here is that people find their own internal motivation why they do it. If it was an external factor pushing you through it and having such a difficult experience, you would probably quit at a certain point. I'm a very stubborn person. <laughs> <laughs> I always like in I, spite of that you I, show to people <laughs> I, I was really dreaming in quitting actually doing my PhD I like moments of my life was not going in the direction I wanted and the PhD was really a burden so I was really feeling very miserable about it yeah I mean the professor motivated me to do it Maybe students listening, but maybe the professors that they were involved in our processes, when they finish that, they would ask you. Because I finished the PhD, no one is really, hey, how is it? How was it for you? What we did right? What we did wrong? Sometimes professors see PhDs as a temporary project, which it is. It's a four-year project. Sometimes professors try to squeeze out the maximum of people. So it's like, okay, you're here for four years. Let me see, you know, how I can uh, get the most out of you. And then you are like, you are going somewhere else. 
most probably you are not staying in university. There are anyway limited places, etc. But you know that that person is going to go to a company. And we are, especially here in Eindhoven, we are in an environment where these collaborations with other companies are super important. Yeah. Especially if you want to bring your idea somewhere, right? And make another project, make a collaboration and something. If you are having a great relationship with this person for four years and that person goes somewhere and has a good memory of this time, the chances are you know whenever you ask something and you want to make a collaboration or whatever this person is going to say yes instantly so for me it's more like a long-term relationship that should be built here rather than a short-term one definitely i think that we are forgetting the business implications sometimes of all this hard work for years focusing also in this really how these PhDs would can become to new startups would be something very interesting and definitely what you mentioned about uh, research and okay the research is built on publications and you are just a, something that produces publications what are they about <laughs> what are their implications maybe it's not so important as far as you do your publications yeah. and that's a little bit what what it that disconnects the full process in my case, I chose choose it because it was a very good choice, but I never really thought what it could be if I don't really choose this. Maybe life would have brought me to another place. Mm. <laughs> if it was not a Ferrari, which other car would it be? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe I would have been happy just walking up to the mountain, you know, like... Yeah, <laughs> it, it, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> If what it will bring you PhD is you will know how to navigate alone towards a goal. You will need to research you the truth. If you want to be an entrepreneur, so you have to research the truth or, or, or validate what you believe. So you have to make an hypothesis, you validate and go through. And then you need to publish, to do marketing, to market yourself. So it's a very complete experience in that sense. For me, it's nice to have done something nobody has done it before. I don't know. I think that when you meet another researcher and so on, for me, it's always, it's, I'm curious, you know, oh, why did you do the research? I, I, actually, for, for me, I think that also a PhD, it's buying time for yourself in that sense, but you have to realize that it will come to an end. You know, like I have four and a half years, then it becomes very long. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a time also to shape yourself. I like the mentoring that I had from my professor in Barcelona. He favored a lot taking time for myself. He knew that I liked it to walk, I liked it to do sports, to climb and so on. He pushed me, if you are stuck, stop anything you're doing, just go to the beach and kite surf. But don't, never stop thinking, you know. That is a very stupid thing and it's very not intuitive because I had many friends that they were just sitting in front of the computer and I did it myself. In my PhD, my three main contributions on three or four contributions the eureka moment i did it out of my office i was pulling my hair uh, like oh this is not working i would go for a walk in the big campus of the high-tech campus and there's like a place that maybe my brain got relaxed and bam ideas came you got a very, very important point there. At a certain point when I got these ideas, I wrote a LinkedIn post on what helped me through a PhD. And it was really other moments than sitting in the office that helped me stay normal. <laughs> Yeah. Well, normal is a big word, but uh, stay sane. So like doing other kinds of activities. And even nowadays, now I'm like, I have a million things on my mind. And also with this podcast, it brings yeah. extra involvement. I was always behind the computer, like editing audio or post-processing stuff or whatever, but always like sitting in there. And then I realized at a certain point, okay, I need to do something else just to uh, give myself some space to breathe and have some other idea come to my mind. Yesterday, I was just writing journal. It helps me yeah. get my thoughts together because now they're bouncing left and right. And then when I write, they yeah, get a so. bit more yeah. precise. <laughs> that helps a lot. For, I, did, I did it a lot in the PhD. I don't know who gave me this tip to write write down the problems I want to solve. I listened once a podcast about MIT psychologies or something like this, that he worked with ideation and helping a lot of corporations to improve life. And that helped me a lot in the PhD because he related how your brain works mm -hmm. and how being relaxed. Maybe best progress, I did it not talking about what I was doing. It was more about how I was doing. And Edward Alarcon covered this space 
since the first moment I, I met him. He brought me to do a PhD, but he was a person who was curious about me. What you do, what are your motivations in life? And it was his openness about who I was, mm. what brought me to the PhD. For sure, he helped me in many other aspects of the PhD, but being able to have this person that is your second supervisor, so it's really very relevant to the research and just being open to talk like this, I think that it's the best ally because I hear so many people that the relationship with the supervisors are very, very tense. We were talking with Edward, like I, I, with him, I wasn't, I had never feared to say Edward, you know, like my biggest dream is like to drop out. <laughs> I'm also thinking about dropping out because I'm so demotivated to write the thesis, which it was really, it was weeks that I was producing nothing. I was not able to really put an introduction. And then we had this conversation with him and, and it was really nice. He said, I completely understand. And really, you could do it. Although if you don't finish the PhD, you will have it all the rest of your life, this thing that you will never have finished chasing you and that was the motivation to really finish you know and then i said wow that's interesting she that pushed the right button she pushed the <laughs> right button and then i sit straight and after one year i had my phd <laughs> <laughs> yes, amazing yeah, yeah. well i could talk really for hours <laughs> yeah, yeah me too, me too, but i think it's time to but maybe yeah, it's uh, yeah, time to yeah and you and have to edit this uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you can make a story about. I all will. Don't yeah. worry. Okay. But really, thank you for all the stories that you shared and for sharing some personal stuff without me even asking about it. I would find this extraordinary when I was doing my PhD <laughs> to listen to you. To be honest. Yeah. Yeah. There are also there were also some personal struggles that I had during the PhD that I would have liked to hear from other people who went through the same struggles and at the end they realized what was important what was not important and it's so much different that from this point you can share certain things because now you have different realizations then if I would have asked you during the PhD you would be like both I have no idea you know depends if you were in your up or your down or... yeah absolutely absolutely yeah but now you can see this is a whole process uh... and now I see the PhD in a second term because the journey that I jump in it's even more uh, like trying to build a company it's very very complex but actually having the conversation with you it's really helping me to refresh a lot because actually one of the things that my PhD I didn't like it is that I isolate a lot and now with my entrepreneurship I've combination with COVID times and so on really made me to isolate me a lot although I achieve certain things you know it's so really going through PhD and my mistakes I see that I keep on doing them is it the PhD or is it me well, okay thank you a lot yeah Good. thank you wow this episode inspired me to share with you a couple of things one of the main is the journaling part because I was doing it right before making this episode and it helped me a lot to condense my thoughts. But then I remember that I started writing a diary when I started my PhD. It was a present from a friend since I mentioned that I was doing it when I was a teenager. So I picked it up again. And I remember in the beginning of the PhD, I was attending like a workshop where they would say, put your goals on paper because ideas bouncing in your head are not going to stick as much as when you put them on paper. So I did it and I remember writing two goals at that time that I wanted to achieve when I would get that diploma. So diploma by itself was uh, one of the goals. There were a couple of other ones as well, but only two stick with me because unfortunately this diary got stolen by the end of my PhD. That's a story for another time. But what I wrote with these two goals, one of them was the number of papers I want to publish. At that time, I was only thinking about those things that you need during a PhD. I was not thinking, okay, who do I want to be as a person? And that is something I would really advise you to do right now. But I wrote, I want to publish three publications in, let's say, a good journal. In the end, I published one in journal, but I had one post deadline paper on a conference, which I'm very proud of, and one paper on a conference, which is very impactful. And going to a conference was more fun for me than writing a paper. Luckily, my supervisor had nothing against that, so I'm <laughs> very grateful for that. In the end, that relates to three papers. So to me, this goal was check. The second one was that I want to be speaking fluently French. And why? Because my PhD was between the Netherlands and the France. 
I had no freaking idea how much time I would spend in one country, how much in the other. I loved French. For me, that's still one of the most beautiful languages. And it was super difficult. Like in the beginning, I would go there to a company. Everybody would speak French. I learned it in high school, but damn, that's not as near as needed what you need to learn a language. So for sure, there was a basics and everything. But speaking is like drowning in unknown waters. And it was super difficult in the beginning. Because I would learn a vocabulary of 100 words to use at work. It's always the same stuff. Technical things. Okay, you can deal with it. And then we would go for lunch. And people would talk about what happened for the weekend, what they're going to do, what's the political situation, etc. That was tough. But with all the ups and downs, now I can proudly say that I'm a fluent French speaker. And those are two random goals that I put on paper. You know, like I just heard that putting things on paper, it's more effective. I only looked back at those things like by the end of my PhD. I was going through my diary and checking how I was feeling, how I was doing during this experience, etc. Then I found these goals. Was Really, when I looked back at them, I remember the feeling that I had when I was writing them and it was a feeling of trial. It was like, okay, let's try this method. To be honest, I didn't believe in it much, but let's just give it a go. It, it sounded very unrealistic on one side, but at that point, really, when I was just starting my PhD, I was writing these goals in four years time, it sounded totally unrealistic. I can tell you that I'm still using the same thing. So at the beginning of the year, I put 10 things that I would like to achieve by the end of this year. And it's been a couple of years in a row. Every time I surprise myself. When I write, I try to put things that seem even unrealistic. And then I surprise myself when those things, they realize themselves even before. Even without me consciously thinking about it. So don't underestimate the power of the unconscious. If you put something on paper, your brain is such a powerful tool to work towards that goal. Now I will challenge you. How about if you would divide your experience into segments of six months? You know how fast you can go, but let's see if you can surprise yourself. I'm curious to hear what is it that you imagine for yourself and what is it that you could achieve. Good luck. Thanks for listening to this podcast episode. If there was anything that you discovered or found remotely interesting, do share. I'm always curious to hear what is it that you resonated with. See you in the next episode.